Thank you all for joining us today. We've got a very wide range of companies on the webinar from many parts of the world, which I think uh, reflects the huge interest there is in keeping up to date with the latest developments in global policy on climate change. My name is Rebecca Fay, and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer here at Natural Capital Partners. Today, we're going to hear from our Managing Director, Jonathan Shockley. Jonathan is a veteran of COP, no reflection on your age, Jonathan, just the number of COPs that you've attended. And he spent many years putting the technical complexities of global, global climate change policy into a language that is relevant for business. Uh, Jonathan's role at Natural Capital Partners is focused on understanding all the external developments that may have an impact on corporate action on climate, whether that's the discussions at Climate Week in New York, a couple of months ago, or something like the Natural Capital Forum in Edinburgh that took place earlier this week. Um, before I hand over to Jonathan today for his thoughts on the issues that will matter to business over the coming months and years, I just have a couple of housekeeping points. All of our attendees are on mute, um, but we would welcome questions. So please use the panel on the right-hand side of your screen to submit any questions, which we will keep track of as we're going along. Um, Jonathan will talk for about 25 minutes and we'll leave plenty of time at the end to go through a Q&A. But if you have any questions on clarity or any jargon that has slipped through the presentation, which isn't explained clearly, then please flag that and we'll clarify that as we go on. Um, and with that, I'm very pleased to hand over to Jonathan. Thank you, Rebecca. So um, I'm going to start, if I may, uh, with a question to you all uh, who are attending. We'd like to do a very quick poll over the next 30 seconds or so. Um, I'll just read it out to you. Um, there's enough clarity, this is the question, there's enough clarity on policy to enable my organization to take the action required to thrive in a carbon constrained world. And you've got five options there. Um, definitely, I guess so. Mm, I'm not so sure. I don't think so. And absolutely not. So I'd love you to um, cast your vote now. We'll quickly have a look at the results. And then um, what I'm going to do is take you through um, really a, a sort of condensed version of what's happened in the last year and see whether uh, at the end of this, um, towards the end of this webinar, um, before we take the Q&A, just see how your mood or your position might have changed. So again, if you haven't voted yet, please vote now. Um, give you a couple of seconds more, and then we're going to close the voting. Right, so um, we're looking at the extremes, definitely 8% and absolutely not 4. Um, but the majority, the clear majority is I in the I don't think so uh, bucket. Um, so let's see how we do. Uh, and Rebecca, if you can keep an eye on those, we'll sort of come back and see what we uh, learn at the end of uh, 25 minutes. Thanks very much. Shall we get to the first slide? Um, so, uh, you might be wondering why uh, on this particular slide we've got a picture of the largest uh, free fall skydiving configuration uh, when we're going to be talking about what happened in climate in the last year. And the reason is, um, you know, it really reflects, in my mind, a little bit of what happened in Paris back in 2015. 195 countries sort of joined hands and jumped out of the climate change aeroplane and started to figure out a new way of collaborating uh, across their different national interests in order to get to a soft landing. I might use this one again, but it stuck with me as a real, um, powerful analog for what's going on. But over the last year, so that was back in 2015 that everybody jumped out of the plane, in the last year the main things that happened was the US withdrawal from the Paris Agreement in June, um, which allowed China to test its role uh, as a climate leader, being now uh, the largest uh, greenhouse gas emitting country. 
Um, and then this enormous burst of non-state action. I, what I want to say about, when I say non-state, I mean non-federal. So under the Paris Agreement, parties, which is another word for countries, are the representative bodies. And non-federal states like California or um, uh, Quebec in Canada are non-state actors. Um, the other thing that happened last year, in my view, is that renewable energy plus storage really took the challenge to fossil, and we are seeing price parity uh, and a range of other issues being solved by that combo. And Paul Hawken published another uh, book, not him, he and a range of uh, scientific researchers, which identified a hundred restorative technologies that he feels um, could really make a difference in terms of reducing greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. And then towards the end of the year, we got uh, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, a collaborative effort, um, I'd say, between um, uh, Bloomberg and Carney um, uh, on behalf of the G20, uh, which put out there the requirement that listed companies should be addressing their climate change risks within their financial reports, bringing the same sort of rigor. So um, why it all matters, the parts uh, for, for, uh, for last year, all the things that happened, this UN bottom-up process, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, uh, this idea of all nations together begins to bite, but in a very unexpected way. And that unexpected way was the US withdrawal, sort of challenged that. And with this enormous burst of non-state action, and you'll see that uh, the we are still in badge on our front, uh, uh, on our front slide, you know, uh, gives business its voice in, in all of this. So, um, Rebecca, you mentioned uh, in New York Climate Week, and then of course I'm going to go on and report about what happened in Bonn. But what happened in in um, in uh, in New York was a, a very visual burst of innovation from organizations whose logos you can see on the left-hand side. Uh, the Sustainable Development Goals provided a very credible framework for action. For the first time, sustainable development has got some kind of teeth and climate change is large, writ large within those. The aviation sector, uh, which is outside, by the way, of the UN process because it's not a country, uh, it's a sector, uh, made progress on its carbon neutral growth. Uh, which is almost challenging the UNFCCC, uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, to come up with rules that will help it do so, uh, to uh, make its growth carbon neutral. And then with all of this burst of innovation, we saw language shifting from mitigation, you know, this gradual incremental reduction of emissions into transformation. How do we move from fossil to renewable? How do we move from um, businesses in the global economy that are contributing less to the problem as opposed to contributing to the solutions? Um, and a, uh, um, we saw from Science-Based Targets um, Initiative and RE100, um, Science-Based Targets is, a, is a, a partnership, WWF, WRI, UN Global Compact and CDP, RE100 led by the Climate Group, um, all very connected to business, developing opportunities for business to take on stretching targets like 100% renewable energy at some specified time um, and science, you know, instead of just reductions until you can't take the pain anymore, rethinking that and saying what sort of internal reduction targets might we need if we were going to respect the science on climate change and doing it in a way that makes it easy for business to take action. And then, um, uh, and that's particularly uh, addresses scope one and two uh, emissions. Scope three, um, outside of direct control of any particular company, we've got a new focus on landscapes uh, and supply chains and an opportunity for um, businesses to really relate um, their direct activities uh, to their supply chain and really make a direct difference in that. And then I have to say, that at New York, uh, there was a debate that continued in to Bonn, which is, do we use market-based instruments like carbon trading, cap and trade, which are known for their cost efficiency and their fungibility, or do we really need to move to climate finance to actually put money to work uh, without markets getting in the way of that? And that's a debate that's raged, and I'll come back to that again. 
So why it all matters, from my perspective, New York was an opportunity to say that it's getting easier and it's getting real uh, when it comes to business taking action. There are a lot of coalitions that weren't there in the past of NGOs, businesses, business organizations linking up uh, to make it easier. Um, now, moving on, uh, no, actually moving back, I just, I, I think before we move to Bonn, it's probably useful just to spend a second um, uh, reprising what Paris was. So, uh, all countries, and I've got those in inverted commas because we know, of course, that uh, the U.S. has did sign up but then exited, um, signed a 16-page agreement with 26 articles that was going to solve climate, that is going to solve climate change. Um, it's a bottom-up architecture which is very different to the Kyoto Protocol which was handing down targets to nations who then had to sort of figure out how to um, implement them. But this bottom-up uh, bottom architecture is interesting because there is really only one hard requirement and that is that each party, each country has to develop its NDC, its nationally determined contribution. There is no requirement to set it at a particular level. You can choose whatever you like, um, but you have to write it down and you have to make a commitment uh, to reaching it and you have to report your progress against that and all of the rest of the stuff I have to say in those 16 pages and 26 are all about that particular construct. And the rest really is about raising ambition and there is no guarantee that we will be able to do that. That will depend on the way in which uh, parties come together and link arms like I showed in that free fall picture and really make some progress in slowing down our rising temperatures. So there are different pathways for every country and they're given lots of freedom to decide what they want to put into their NDCs, nationally determined contributions, but there's not different treatment like we had under the Kyoto Protocol where developed countries had targets and those who were developing didn't. Everybody's got targets, we're all in the same boat and that feels right. Just a quick reminder while we're looking back for a second, the Kyoto Protocol was supposed to be renewed in 2013. And um, at the COP, the Conference of the Parties um, in Copenhagen in 2009, it was a failure. We failed to get a successor agreement in. So the CAN got kicked down the road to 2015 to Paris when there was a commitment to get something in place. And everybody, all the countries who'd signed up to Kyoto were asked to recommit themselves to a continuance of the Kyoto Protocol till 2020 and that was in the Doha COP where they made that commitment and I have to, I'm sad to report that very few countries have actually recommitted. I'll be back to that too. Um, so uh, while we're doing quick updates, let's just do one on the science as well. Um, as everybody on this call I'm sure knows, um, hugely complicated climate science has been distilled into an iconic target of two degrees Celsius. We mustn't allow average global temperatures to go over, to rise above two degrees because then we will have lasting damage to all of our capitals, human capital, economic capital, environmental capital, climate capital. Um, and behind that target, of course, is, 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 you know, there are volumes of scientific work, but it is, it has been useful in helping the scientific community explain and engage with the political process and in fact written into the Paris Agreement is something which says we're aiming for two degrees but we want to raise ambition to go beyond to get down to a limit of 1.5 degrees because the science is already indicating that that would be more realistic. And in fact the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, uh, which is appointed by all the parties to the UNFCCC, uh, is investigating the 1.5 option. How easy, what will be the implications of setting that as a new target? But I have to say that behind that two degrees Celsius, uh, as much as I think it's a powerful hook to hang everything on, um, is a real worry among many scientists that we, we just can't anticipate major discontinuities, melting of the tundra, release of huge amounts of methane, a reversal of the Atlantic conveyor belt because of, global, of, of oceanic warming. And that isn't even factored into all of this. So the science is strengthening, it's communicating better with the policy world, but it hasn't really bottomed the issue out. Um, so how are we doing uh, against this uh, 
two degree target. Uh, PDRBC does an annual report on the low carbon um, e economy index and as you can see on um, uh, the figure um, on the left hand side, um, we have for the last year actually decoupled GDP growth from global emissions. But there is a warning to that. India and China and Nigeria and Brazil, South Africa have hardly started their development pathways, so it could easily rise before it falls. And in fact, um, what, uh, just to summarize uh, PwC's conclusions, is we're only halfway there on current performance uh, to towards the sort of the the pathway that we need, the kind of reductions we need, or the decarbonization rate um, is currently 3%, we need it to be 6.3%. So, um, and, and actually when you add up all the NDCs, uh, their commitments, and translate that into how we track this, we're tracking to a three degree world rather than a two degree world, as things stand at the moment. Um, right. So now, finally, we get to the fun bit. What happened in Bonn uh, in a couple of weeks ago? Um, I, I'm going to replace that image of those skydivers falling now with the four, four stages of a butterfly's life cycle. Uh, if you think of Paris as laying the egg uh, of a beautiful butterfly that's going to um, link us all together uh, and crack the code on climate change. Um, that egg actually hatched about a year earlier than we thought it would. Countries were so enthused by that process, that bottom-up process, the leeway that they were given to define their own pathways, that um, they signed, they all ratified the agreement about a year earlier. So everybody was caught slightly on the back foot. So um, the Marrakesh COP uh, at the end of last year got into some of the details, but really the Bonn COP was a working COP, something where um, every country was asked to start working on um, how they were going to reach their NDCs. So the hungry, hungry caterpillar was out because most countries on a, are on a trajectory of rising greenhouse gas emissions and they need money funding in order to decouple. Uh, significantly uh, their growth, their economic growth from, from emissions. So what we've got is a caterpillar that's uh, sort of, you know, gobbling up as much as it can and, and as a result of that, um, the torturous work began to sort of take all of these wants. Um, so the 16-page agreement or the, the Paris Agreement sort of grew into hundreds of pages of draft text to create a rule book uh, by the end of next year, 2018, at the Polish COP, which would be the implementation plan. But a lot of things stood in the way because everybody realized now that every party realized that money is somehow required or technology or innovation. So there's lots to do before we enter into the pupa stage, which is sort of the, when the rule book gets wrapped up uh, with all these wants having been sort of negotiated into something that's coherent and consistent, so that between the end of 2018 and when the Paris Agreement comes into force in 2021, we have the emergence of a beautiful butterfly. Um, so thank you for indulging me that um, uh, rather colorful uh, analogy. Um, the other thing I wanted to just mention about uh, the Paris Agreement is that it commits countries to a global stock take on how we're doing by 2023, but there are going to be another, a couple of others along the way. So why this matters really is that um, the true impact of the US withdrawal becomes apparent because it's all about the money. And the one thing that I haven't said about the US withdrawal is that it removes something like 40% of the monies that were promised um, uh, at the Paris uh, uh, COP from the table uh, if, if the administration follows through with its real intent. So, moving on, I've got three little bits now just to go into some of the details around, uh, around the bond uh, bit and I've called it the crunchy bits, the fun bits, and the pointy bits. So the crunchy bits. Um, the Kyoto Protocol, the orphan child, uh, developing countries have suddenly realized that they leapt out of a plane with a bunch of cheats. People who are not going to sign up and are not going to give them the money that actually encouraged them to jump out of the plane in the first place. 
Then we've got the NDC challenge, the nationally determined contributions. Countries haven't really been given a very clear format on how to write them. So some are one year, some are multi-year, some of them are economy-wide, some of them are not. So it's what I call the putty to Lego challenge. What you're really looking for is all of these NDCs to sort of click together like Lego blocks and create a stable climatic structure. But some are very floppy like putty and some are quite well defined and economy wide and have got absolute targets, others do not. And then and I, I had to come back to this, the money challenge. Um, under the, the Kyoto Protocol, actually, there was a commitment to raising $100 billion to help developing countries, you know, in their trajectories. And um, we're, we're actually having struggle to raise that $100 billion. But on top of that, layering on top of that, they've got, they've, we've got developing countries and small island states uh, looking for funding for obvious reasons. We've got um, countries that have been deeply affected by climate change already, I can think of one, Kenya, uh, they're looking for adaptation funding to help them adapt rather than mitigate. Uh, we've got countries who might suffer major weather impacts, rising sea levels, uh, greater storms, and these are poor countries. You just think of the hurricane season that we've um, experienced recently. They're looking for a loss and damage fund so that they can repair uh, what is a global punishment uh, visited upon them uh, on no fault of their own. And then we've got forests, uh, the rainforests around the world, which are a really key part of the solution. They don't generate any income in and of themselves. They provide a global capital asset of sequestration operating as a sink. They need money. And then uh, intriguingly, the oil, coal and gas countries have sort of come forward and said, you know, we're giving up a lot of our national wealth if we don't pump oil, dig coal. So we're looking for a stranded assets compensation as well. So there's a lot of claims out there. And um, the ratcheting ambition, uh, you know, within this context of having a little bit of a scratchy time around the money is going to be difficult. So why does this all matter? The funding is a material issue that could further threaten unity around the Paris Agreement. We've heard, for example, South Africa refusing to sign off on some of the negotiations in Bonn until the developed countries stand true to their commitments that they made earlier. So now enough of the gloomy bit, here let's have the fun bits. Um, the most extraordinary thing for me um, was to visit um, the US Climate Action Center and to hear about the America's pledge, the We Are Still In uh, coalition. Now, um, America didn't have it, used to, has always had an amazing presence at the COPS. NASA's there with all of its data and, uh, you know, projections of um, ocean warming and so on. It's stunning stuff. So that's obviously been scaled right back. But outside of the negotiating zones and the zones where you needed a badge to get in, um, Bloomberg uh, and Jerry Brown, I'll just call those two guys out, really got the We Are Still In an America's Pledge Coalition together and funded a venue which was amazing um, in terms of representing what probably is the majority view in America that uh, US multinational companies need to stay in and need to make commitments. And in fact, um, it was at that pavilion uh, that Jerry Brown, uh, Governor Jerry Brown from California and Michael Bloomberg from Bloomberg Phil Philanthropies announced uh, phase one or presented phase one of their report, the America's Pledge Report, which isn't just a we're still in, it's a we're still in 20 states, subnational states, of course, 110 cities, uh, 1,300 businesses representing about 25 trillion in cap. And collectively, those who've signed the We Are Still In and participated in the America's Pledge represent GDP of about $100 trillion. China is 11 trillion. The US is 18 trillion. So this group of American businesses, cities, universities, um, uh, states, um, is really quite a power, powerful force. And that was a lot of fun and gave uh, all of us, you know, uh, we took great heart out from that. The other thing that I thought was interesting is um, a number of technology companies had sponsored a hack for climate boat, a hundred um, geek coders 
used uh, blockchain or similar technologies to crack, uh, to hack out solutions to climate challenges. And it was that application of technology which we know is going to be transformative in the way in which we are able to track measure, which is the biggest problem under um, the, the Paris Agreement, is how do we know people are actually making progress? And that kind of application of technology is going to be transformative. And I'm leaving aside all of the Bitcoin and the whatever coin stuff, I'm just talking about our ability to effectively understand what's going on in our world. And then um, there, there was the, what I haven't mentioned is that the presidencies of each of these COPs passed from one country to another and it was the first time that a small island state, Fiji, took on um, the role of being the president of the COP. And um, they did an amazing job. Of course, the fact that they're in a small island that's deeply at risk uh, by changing climate gave them some voice and credibility. And they um, brought, uh, just Flicking to the pictures on, on the left-hand side, by the way, um, we've got uh, Jerry Brown, Mayor Bloomberg, um, we've got the, uh, the incoming Prime Minister of uh, Fiji uh, lined up with Patricia Espinosa on the pledge within the Americas uh, venue. What we've got below that is a bunch of Fijian um, dancers. And those of you who are rugby fans, uh, they're not doing the CB, which is the equivalent of the haka. That's actually a, a sort of a, um, a, 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 which is a war dance at the beginning of a rugby match. Um, but they they were very prevalent in bringing a new tone to the feel of the negotiations. And written into um, the Paris Agreement is a facilitated dialogue, which was going to be another, is another way for a sort of tough negotiating session. And the Fijians have decided to replace that with a Talanoa dialogue, which is a sort of a, um, a term that they use for um, getting people together to talk through tough problems. And they've got three simple questions that they're going to raise in this Talanoa dialogue amongst all nations, which is where are we now? Where do we want to go? How do we get there? You might be thinking that maybe it's a bit late in the day to be asking these questions, but it's going to be incredibly powerful and it's got a huge amount of support. Um, and the other thing that's critical about this is it's an inclusive process. Business, non-state actors, are encouraged to participate. That's been very um, different to what we've had in the past. Um, and there's a, a real expectation from that, that we will get a change in tone and an ability to have dialogue that's really quite meaningful under a process that's pretty tough to negotiate within. And then we've got the Powering Past Coal Alliance of about 25 countries who are going to get out of coal completely by 2030. Um, I should say that's, that, that might sound like a lot of um, a commitment there, but it's about 0.2 billion um, uh, short tons per year are in that coalition. There are 8.5 billion tons that are outside of that, um, but it is a small seed that could well grow into something big. And then the singing to break the deadlock. Um, uh, there was a lot of singing actually um, in in the halls and in the negotiating halls. The Fijians came and just sort of lightened things up a bit. But apparently Saudi Arabia, when uh, they were negotiating some various tracks and Saudi was holding up one of the negotiating streams because they couldn't quite get what they wanted in another negotiating stream and then came in and sort of said, well, listen, if the co-chairs of this particular work stream were prepared to sing a particular song, they'd give over. So that was funny. Um, now, um, moving on to the pointy bits. Um, you know, uh, as I mentioned in, in my sort of summary opening slide, I think that renewable energy or the energy part of this challenge is probably fixed. We're getting lower and lower costs of renewable energy to the point where actually coal, gas, and ultimately oil may be quite challenged by that renewables and storage solution. But biodiversity is in real trouble. And that image to the top left there is a, a photograph of palm oil kind of abutting right up against a rainforest. Uh, and I believe that's in, in Indonesia, in uh, Sumatra. Um, and, um, you know, this is an intractable problem. How do we, how do we really get enough funding? Um, 
to address the biodiversity and trouble question. Um, the other bits are the markets versus non-markets approaches and in the Paris Agreement we have got um, Article 6, and I'm not going to go into the details of that, but Article 6 says we know that we make better progress if countries collaborate and particularly if developed countries are able to support developing countries by funding reductions. But because everybody's got targets, we need to make sure there's no double counting under that system. So there's a lot of accounting problems to be solved in that. And also there are some countries who are not really keen on market approaches. But on the last count, 40 countries had committed to market-based solutions and 20 sub-nationals as well, like California and Quebec, um, are, are also um, keen on seeing that, that solution develop. Um, the transparency versus uh, sovereignty. Country, some countries are good sort of bumping up against this issue that if we have to report all of this stuff and have people opine on whether it's good enough uh, for the Paris Agreement for the rest of the world, there are issues of sovereignty, of nation-state sovereignty over what they control and what they can release and how they do all of that. That becomes a bit of a pointy bit as well. Money where it matters. Um, there is actually a fair amount of climate finance, money that's seeking um, uh, to address climate issues. Um, some of it's been double counted, it's the same old aid budget being counted as climate finance. And IIAD, the International Institute for Environment and Development, has done some research which says of all of this stuff, less than 10% gets to the communities that really need it. So a lot of stickiness along the way. Um, and then one of the things that we as natural capital partners have been very interested in is this uh, the, you know, redefining voluntary action, carbon offsetting under Paris world. We need to be able to, we need to make sure um, that under these rules we don't have double counting or double claiming. Uh, that means that actually voluntary action of the likes that you see on the table on the left hand side, various companies that have committed to e either are carbon neutral or committing to carbon neutrality, that they aren't letting the parties off the hook, as it were, by delivering uh, reductions uh, so that the countries can sort of perhaps soft pedal a little bit on on the tough policies or regulations that they need to to implement. But there are three broad ways in which um, voluntary action can definitely carry on. There are uh, NDCs that are not economy-wide, um, uh, in the least developed economies in particular, and that gives space for continuation of voluntary, of carbon offsetting pretty much as we had under Kyoto. There's the climate finance where countries simply say, yep, yeah, we understand that there's an agreement, we respect that, we don't need to make any claims other than we are helping our countries or the countries in which we operate meet their targets. And then there's the Corsia uh, precedent, Corsia being the carbon offset reduction uh, scheme for international aviation. They want this carbon neutral growth. They're going to need accounting rules that enable them to participate in offset projects in countries and then not double count that. So that means that when they solve that problem, which they'll have to, uh, voluntary action has got another opportunity to continue. So, um, I am almost there. Um, the role of business. Uh, just just a, a, a quick um, a review of that. It felt very different um, being there as a representative of a business delegation, the uh, International Emissions Trading Association, which had a business hub within not the negotiating row, uh, zone, but in, in one of the, the, the zones associated with, with the negotiations. And we had a lot of uh, negotiators come to events at, um, at that hub. Um, this involvement of business was always encouraged by Christiana Figueres, who was head of the UNFCCC until uh, two years ago. Um, some parties uh, are divided on whether business really has a role, whether it's the problem, and it tends to follow the sort of left-right political leanings. So Bolivia, Venezuela, really not happy to have businesses there. Many other countries like Ukraine, and there were um, actually we're, we're calling for the inclusion of energy corporates within within the negotiations. And then a gateway countries, seven seven countries with, rain, with rainforest or forest protection issues who really wanted to set up a, a trading platform to help 
private sector and members of the public and countries participate and fund their forest protection programs. But that wasn't really entertained within, uh, with, with, within uh, the negotiations. So the hard lines in, in, uh, thawed a little bit in Bonn and um, uh, there were lots of debates. I, uh, by the way, this, the, the, the picture on the left, the bottom one, uh, is of me. It's uh, um, actually uh, conducting a very informal, rather alcohol-fueled debate about the future of offsetting at the AIETA AGM, which was later joined by a number of negotiators who came from different countries just to, because they thought that the, the issues that are being debated by business to make this business friendly so that business can deploy capital at scale uh, into the problem are really important. Um, uh, critical to, um, so the, the, as I mentioned, the Talanoa dialogue has already written this in, uh, that the private sector has a role. The America's pledge, I already mentioned, uh, is largely populated by business. And Corsair opens up another dimension in the sense that it's a sector that's taking on its own target. And one wonders whether the big emitters like the mining sector or the metals and materials sector might consider doing something similar uh, if the rules get um, um, are put in place. So what happens next year? Let's think forward for a moment. It's, um, if you look at the, the, the diagram on the left, you can see a couple of set of headlines. A massively busy year. Um, it's a heavily truncated schedule, but you can see that it's going to be about politics, negotiation, it's going to be an update of the science from the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, there's going to be a New York City Climate Week and there's also going to be a We Are Still In and the America's Pledge uh, equivalent over in San Francisco in September um, and then of course the next COP in Poland which is the big one because that's when we hope that the pupa will be fully formed and we have the rule book uh, for, to solve many of these problems uh, all in place. So you know why it matters it's a make or break year for the smooth passage, passage of the implementation of the Paris Agreement. And now to my final slide before we get to the vote again. Um, I am an optimist um, and um, so when, when we asked that question at the beginning I, I, you know, I, have, a, I have a natural bias. Um, but I think if you asked me to look into a crystal ball and look for an optimistic but realistic outcome I think it would be these um, five bullet points. I think the US withdrawal uh, will have been seen as the making of a political process that is much more resilient and much more inclusive and much more effective. I think that the narrative is shifting from incremental change to transformation which will really allow us to make significant progress even though a significant part of the world still has got a lot of development to go, a lot of development way to go. Um, I think that the effective, you know, the need for effective finance will reignite market-based approaches, the carbon market, which is, um, and bring us a price, a useful price and a meaningful price on carbon, because that is the quickest, cheapest, and most effective way of putting capital to work. Renewables triumph, I think I've said that before, oceans and landscapes are going to struggle. This is the unfunded bit of our world that is really becoming important to fix. And um, um, I think that carbon sinks which to repair any overshoot in our, um, in our climate uh, is going to become uh, pretty critical as well. Um, and net zero becomes a compelling business goal. A more compelling business goal perhaps than two degrees Celsius. That's a nice icon for action. But people need to understand, as has been said, laid out in the Paris Agreement, we need to be net zero by the second half of the century. So I'm going to stop there. Um, and oh, my, my why it matters is, um, why it matters to be an optimist is a lot of this depends, if you think about the Talanoa dialogue and the way in which this is sort of opening up, on our individual and collective view of success. So I'm hoping that there are more optimists than pessimists around. So um, shall we do that poll again, give you uh, a couple of minutes before we take questions uh, to answer the following question. It's not the same one as we started with. So having spent a little time talking you through um, what's happened in the past year, what's going to happen next, do you feel, I, you know, let me read it out, I now feel more positive 
or less, do I feel more positive or less positive about action required by my business to thrive in a carbon constrained world? And you've got three options here. More positive, no change, or less positive. Um, I'm just going to give you a couple of seconds to, um, to answer that before we fling the results up on the screen. And then Rebecca, I'm going to turn over to you to see what questions we've got uh, for, the, for the remaining uh, time. I'm going to take that as an unbridled success. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and I hope you're not just being kind to me. Rebecca, over to you. Thank you, Jonathan. And yes, you should take that as an unbridled success. Nice work um, on building up some positive thinking. So I, there's been a few questions, some of which are very simple ones. And in fact, the first one I'm going to answer, I think I can probably answer it very quickly, is uh, someone asked if there's an equivalent of the New York Climate Week happening in the UK or Europe anywhere. Um, no, there isn't this year, as far as we know. There was a climate week held in London about two years ago, I would say, um, which I don't think was hugely successful. So I think that the, um, the primary organizers of climate week, the climate group, have sort of focused all their resources and efforts on the New York event. And Jonathan, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it would be fair to say that the New York event this year did attract a lot of attendance from all over the world. So it was a fairly significant event happening throughout the city. Um, and it will be interesting to see what the uh, West Coast event that's being organized, not by climate, the climate group, but the other the West Coast event that's being organized for September. It will be interesting to see how that one works out. Um, a couple of other questions for you then, Jonathan. Um, firstly, could you give us a sense of which countries are leading in the climate change negotiations? Which do you think, and the, in terms of which are most likely, which countries are most likely to have ambitious policy coming up because they are really taking the lead in what needs to happen with climate change? Obviously, China, you mentioned, but are there other countries that spring to mind where you think they're likely to have some ambitious policy to start to meet these climate change goals? The, uh, thank you. Um, I think, you know, there are countries like Costa Rica that's got a very well thought through carbon neutral plan, but it's a small country. Um, the whole of the EU bloc is recognized for having quite well thought through ambitious targets and plans, despite their complicated governance structure across 28, soon to be 27 countries. Um, and then um, China, in terms of its programs to decarbonize its economy, um, I think um, you know, has drawn a lot of respect. Um, but you know, the negotiations are tough. You can't negotiate 198 countries one on one. So there are blocks uh, that form. They're the BRIC countries: South Africa, Brazil, India, China. That you know take the lead on certain issues. It's quite a fluid. Um, it's quite a fluid thing because sometimes very progressive. Uh, country like the EU has Poland uh, in its mix and they have a lot of coal and they're really concerned about jobs um, and so sometimes you have sort of sea anchors even within some of the most progressive countries. Thank you. Um, and another question which is partly a point of clarification which is about the sort of clarity on what the difference is around climate finance versus offsetting. Is the fundamental difference that it's about who can own that emission reduction claim or um, and therefore you know climate finance is going towards a country and it's merging into the country's NDC versus offsetting the company can claim that emission reduction or is there something more that you would say is the difference between the two things? I think that um, climate finance is when either a private sector, you know, a company or a country pays money for a program of work that will either mitigate or adapt to climate change and there may be a goal um, uh, that is set and it may be verified, it may not. Uh, it's often very, very difficult to track that. Offsetting is when money literally is the funds are used to buy the ultimate objective which is the mitigation, so a carbon credit. So 
the money only flows when you've had a success associated with that financial intervention. Uh, I could go on, but I know we're up against time, but I, I think there's sort of very, very marked differences and also, you know, the finance tends to go directly to the projects uh, and get used in, 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 rather than through intermediaries or government lending, bilateral lending and the like. Thank you. We do have a few more questions, but actually we're right on time now. So um, we always like to stick to the time that we allocate for our webinars. So I would like to, uh, first of all, thank you, Jonathan, for that. That was fantastic. Really appreciate your time. And also thank all of our attendees for um, listening in. And please bear in mind, if you have any questions that weren't we weren't able to answer, we will respond to you separately to answer your questions. And we will be sending sending you the recording of the webinar, which um, feel, please feel free to share that amongst your colleagues. And with that, I would like to say goodbye and have a good remainder of your Wednesday. And a goodbye from me too. Thank you. <laughs>